Many of you will know that the ICS has produced its own history and was published last year in August with the editors being Norm and Eric Glenn and myself. And so I got to know him quite well over that period. In fact, I first met him at the Paris meeting in 1972. And so it goes back a long way. Um, he is a great guy and Joe Bladis is going to pay a tribute to him. Uh, Joe is the clinical professor of urology at uh, uh, Cornell uh, and well known to all of the society, I'm sure, and even better known as the editor-in-chief and founder of neurourology and neurodynamics. Joe. Thank you, Ted. I am honored to offer this tribute to Norm Zinner here in China, the land of Confucius. Confucius was born in the 6th century BC and he died in 1495, but his spirit lives on in the hearts and minds and the very soul of hundreds of millions of people. He is part of the soul of this country. So what is the soul? I asked a famous theologian and his answer resonated with me. It's like the first law of thermodynamics, he replied, quoting Albert Einstein. Energy, he said, can neither be created nor destroyed. It can only be changed from one form to another. And so it is with the soul. And so it is with Norm. Look at his face, his presence, his smile, beaming down upon the society that he loved best of all. Excuse me. The society he nurtured from its infancy and the society whose meeting he attended for nearly every one of its 40 plus years of existence. Norm was born in Brooklyn, New York in 1934 and the soul of Brooklyn was forever in Norm. Brooklyn with a population of two and a half million was really a city of thousands of ethnic neighborhood, neighborhoods, and as Norm grew older, his neighborhood expanded. He became a citizen of the world, first Indiana, then Chicago, New York, Virginia, Washington, Leiden, Los Angeles, and when he finally set, settled down in Palos Verdes, he brought a little bit of Brooklyn with him. Here he is, 74 years later, behind the, fount the counter of his fully outfitted Brooklyn style soda fountain and here he is here uh, serving norm, a urologist, a member of our organization David Ginsberg and his family and 200 or more of his very close friends at one of his famous parties. There was no occasion too small for a Zinner party. As a, as a young school child Norman was forever getting into trouble until he was tested and it was discovered that he was too smart for his peers and too smart for his teachers. He enrolled in, ex in an experimental school where he excelled and he graduated high school at age 17, then off to Purdue University where he was tested again and again found to be too smart. He graduated in just two years and he enrolled at the University of Chicago Medical School where he graduated after four years. Not even Norm could cut a medical education short. He worked his way through college and medical school as a soda jerk, a short order cook, and a waiter, working two jobs at a time. His passion for cooking and his hosting was never extinguished. Norm and Nancy were married in 1979. They were blessed with four children, Ralph, Sam, Mar Marilyn, and Jonathan, the father of his cherished grandson, Avery. Norm's curriculum vitae is impressive. All 111 pages that I had the, had the pleasure of reading. But insofar as this society is concerned, one of Norm's proudest achievements was his pivotal role in the creation of the ICS Standardization Committee, um, which Ted Arnold just told me Norm first recommended back in 1968 um, when he was part of the original hydrodynamics of McDerishan meeting. But the quality of my good friend, our good friend, reside not in the compendium of his accomplishments, but in the qualities of his soul. 
First and foremost, Norm was a genuinely good and kind person, a devoted husband, father, and friend, a friend to practically everyone. If you knew Norm, he was your friend. I recently asked Nancy, did he really like everyone? Everyone? I said. She said yes, but then she added she guesses that he likes some she like he likes some better than others. Senda Hershon, um, our uh, esteemed secretary, put it another way. He told me just the other day, Norm never said a negative thing about anyone. He just had other priorities. Norm radiated kindness and warmth and affability, regaling friends and audiences with stories and insights into just about everything, from his worldwide travels to the intricacies of the urinary stream as it exited from the nozzle of the urethral meatus and broke up into tiny droplets. And, and he was smart. He was very smart. But most of all, he was a catalyst, an optimistic, futuristic, divergent thinker who challenged you to think and made, just by his very presence, uh, made you uh, try harder and be better and to try to figure things out and especially to, to beat him in a debate. Unknowingly, he was a pioneer in what we now call translational research, fostering the intellectual cross-fertilization of such seemingly dis, disparate disciplines of physics, neurophysiology, mathematics, hydrodynamics, chemical engineering, and high-speed video cinematography that became the foundations of aerodynamics and of our understanding of lower urinary tract physiology and pathophysiology. Here he is 45 years later with his two good friends and collaborators, Rogers Ritter and Art Stern. Who else but Norman could engage an experimental nuclear physicist to become involved with the mundane world of the lower urinary tract? In, uh, in 1980, Norm organized the first debate that this society has ever witnessed. witnessed. I don't know who track debate, tracks debates, but to my knowledge, this was the very first debate at the urology meeting. I was a proud participant in that debate, and to this day, it was the most terrifying thing that I ever did. In keeping with his own affability, though, Norm announced that each side won the debate. We, the Americans, won the audience poll, but the date debate judges sided with the Europeans. Sounds like a soccer match, actually. So I would be chagrined to let this debate go on without a word from Norm. In his last days, we talked about overactive bladder. What a pity that is to, have to spend your last days, but that's another thing. But I know his thoughts very well, and coincidentally, his thoughts... Um, his thoughts are mine. Um, when talking about overactive bladder, he said, creating simplistic definitions like overactive bladder and, la and labels is not the way to go. These are all direct, direct quotes. So if the, uh, it leads what, to what, no, what Norm called no-think. It makes it easy to tell someone what they have. You have overactive bladder. But I, the doctor, really don't know what it is. So let's try this or that empiric treatment. And, but wouldn't it be better to think about the problem rather than handing the patient a pill and walking into the next room to see the next patient? Creating, excuse me, if you come home and you have no desire to urinate, see the garage door, get an overwhelming urge to urinate, where did this come from? Not the bladder, the volume didn't change. If you turn on the faucet and get a sudden urge to urinate, where did that come from? Not the bladder. So why do we call it overactive bladder? To summarize um, what, what Norm, what actually, the first part of this I convinced Norm about, to, that, uh, that, to consider that overactive bladder is a symptom complex, not a syndrome. But what Norm added to, the, uh, to our opinion was, I don't even like the word. So, to end, there really, I was going to end with this slide, but there really is no end to this eulogy because there's no end to Norm's soul. His soul is part of the soul of the society. 
He is a part of me and is a part of you, and of, of course a part of his beloved family for generations and to generations to come. And for that we can all be eternally grateful. What a great guy. He was a great colleague, a friend, a, a clear thinker, and thank you, Jerry, for all those uh, memories. I think it would be nice if, if we invite everyone to stand for a moment of silence in memory of Norman Zimmer. Thank you.